hero. Any person admired for courage, nobility, or exploits, especially in war. Any person admired for qualities or achievements, and regarded as an ideal or model. They rise to the occasion. They meet the challenge. They inspire us. They are heroes. Joe M. Jackson, born 1923 in Noonan, Georgia. Mr. Jackson entered the service in 1941 and became a pilot. He served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and retired as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He now lives outside of Seattle, Washington. Joe Jackson received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Lyndon Johnson for actions in Vietnam as the pilot of a C-123 transport on May 12, 1968. On that date, Colonel Jackson volunteered to attempt the rescue of a three-man United States Air Force combat control team from the Special Forces Camp at Kamduk. Hostile forces had overrun the forward outpost and established gun positions on the airstrip. We could hear the fire coming out of the jungle, uh, automatic weapons fire and, and uh, rifle fire. Uh, while, we in, while we were in the air on final approach, we could also hear the automatic weapons fire while we were sitting on the ground and the rifle fire. The camp was engulfed in flames. Ammunition dumps were continuously exploding and littering the runway with debris. Eight aircraft had been destroyed by the intense enemy fire, with one aircraft on the runway reducing their usable length to only 2,200 feet. I don't think we were on the ground more than a minute because it was a matter of just touching down, uh, rolling to a, a severe stop, breaking as hard as we could, uh, waiting a few seconds, and I can't say how long, until the three guys got on board, taxiing around the rocket, applying power, and uh, getting airborne. It didn't take too long to get airborne, maybe uh, 15 seconds. So I think we was on the ground less than a minute. This photograph, the only time an action leading to the Medal of Honor has been captured on film, shows Colonel Jackson's C-123 on the airstrip at Cam Duck. 30 seconds after landing, and just before the three men he rescued clambered on board the plane. 30 seconds later, Jackson piloted the plane out of harm's way. Colonel Jackson's conspicuous gallantry, his profound concern for his fellow men, and his intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Air Force and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of his country. If I tried to explain to you the, the feelings and the emotions uh, uh, and all of this, you would never understand it, and unless you were there. And if you were there, you, it wouldn't need to explain it to you. You, you would know. In a lot of respects, I'd, uh, would, I'd say I'd rather do that all over again than to, than to go to the White House to, to get the medal. I'm very proud at that moment, but I feel a responsibility to uh, the thousands of, the, of other people that have done things in, in combat that have never been recognized for it. There were two of us from the same hometown that day, uh, town of Noonan, Georgia, uh, Major Stephen Pless, a Marine officer, and myself. If I may, uh, I'd like to have a, a picture with Mr. Pless and uh, Mr. Jackson. I doubt that there are many towns with under 5,000 population that produced uh, two Medal of Honor winners in the same day. And uh, I would like to keep this picture among my souvenirs because it happens that uh, one of them is on a 123 where I have a loadmaster son-in-law and the other one is a Marine Corps. Uh, that we have represented out there too and I want to send the other one to Secretary Rusk because uh, uh, he's from Georgia and long before daylight this morning I got a call that we were proceeding to uh, an agreement with substantive talks in the Paris negotiation which would indicate that we are step near a peace and uh, if we are and we pray we are It'll be because of men like your great commander, General Westmoreland, and men like you who 
offered your life to try to bring peace to the entire world. That peace and ending the war in Vietnam would elude Lyndon Baines Johnson. This ceremony took place on January 16, 1969. Four days later, Mr. Johnson would leave the White House and the presidency with the war still waging. Joe Jackson looks back on that time during the Vietnamese conflict with mixed feelings, but with a very strong sense of his duty. Nobody that I know ever volunteers to go to war, but the flying was good over there and, and the mission was good. Uh, in retrospect, I don't think the war should ever have happened. Uh, but as my position in the military, you know, it, it's not for me to say whether or not it should have happened. If they tell me to go, it's, uh, it's up to me to go. Heroes will be back in a moment. Heroes. Lieutenant Colonel Jackson flew this C-123 during his tour of duty in Vietnam. It was a mission which the seasoned pilot enjoyed. Oh, the old airplane was, was uh, it was a lot of fun to fly, but it was, it was a tough airplane to fly. Uh, the controls were heavy and uh, it took a lot of work. And noisy, noisiest airplane in the whole world. The, the airplane really started out as a glider. It was supposed to land heavy equipment during the invasion of Europe, but they didn't have adequate numbers nor hadn't had enough of them soon enough to get them active in the service. So when the war was over, they had all of these airframes around that, with no engines on them, uh, nothing to do with them. So they said, well, let's, let's make a transport out of them and call them a C-123. It kind of gives you a feeling of satisfaction to be able to haul cargo to these outposts and have the young people, the soldiers come out and glad to see you and uh, what have you got for me today? One of the outposts which the C-123 flew into was a place called Cam Duc, sitting along South Vietnam's border with Laos. It was a strategic location, a place to intercept the North Vietnamese coming south through Laos. In 1970, the U.S. forces retook the base at Cam Duc. The destroyed planes were still there, left from that fierce battle in 1968, when the North Vietnamese overran the outpost and captured it from the Americans on May 12, 1968. On the 12th of May, I was scheduled to get a flight check. Uh, every six months, air crew members uh, get their proficiency checked to see if they can still fly airplanes uh, well enough to be called a pilot. So uh, on that day, I was scheduled to get a flight check. And the, in in the check pilot, was a Major Campbell, Jesse Campbell. Uh, we took off in the morning. We had a scheduled route going up and down the coast, uh, hauling people and cargo. Well, this was going along, you know, about normal, until about one o'clock or shortly after one, uh, and it, uh, when we was at a base called Chulai, was a mar Marine base, uh, we got word through the airlift control element to return immediately to Da Nang for uh, a special high priority mission. That mission was to help with the evacuation of soldiers and civilians from Cam Duc, under attack by the North Vietnamese, with all hell breaking loose, shown by these photographs taken during the attack. Within three hours of being given his mission, Jackson was circling his C-123 at 9,000 feet above Cam Duck. One person called in and said that he had uh, picked up the last of the survivors. And uh, shortly after that, another airplane called and said, no, 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 he had just let off a combat control team uh, to control the remainder of the evacuation. Well, what happened was that these three people were the only friendlies on the ground, and the base had com been completely overrun by the North Vietnamese. They had set up gun positions along the runway. They were in complete control of all of the barracks and the buildings and bunkers uh, throughout the camp. So I saw the airplane in front of me. Uh, he touched down, rolled along the runway, didn't see the, the uh, three guys. However, they had seen him. 
they left the bunker where they were holed up and headed for the runway. About, uh, about the time they, they uh, were getting close to the runway, he had applied power to go around and had just lifting off when he saw the three guys. And uh, he called in that he had seen them and what their location was, but he had been there a lot longer than I had. He was low on fuel and had to go back to Tonsonut. And uh, so the Airborne Command Post uh, broadcast on the radio if there was anybody in the vicinity that would attempt to pick them up. And we were right there, right over the airfield. We'd seen what was going on. We knew from his description just about where the guys was, and so it was only logical. And uh, <clears throat> Major Campbell, who was in uh, as, as a co-pilot because the flight check had been terminated, uh, called and said, Roger, we're going in. Although fully aware of the extreme danger and likely failure of such an attempt, Colonel Jackson elected to land his aircraft and attempt the rescue. Uh, I call, I want the landing checklist and I want the assault landing checklist at the same time. At that time, I pulled the throttles all the way back to the stop and I pushed the propellers all the way forward. Okay, pulling the throttle back took all of the power off the engines. Pushing the prope propeller pitch uh, forward made them flat against the, the airstream, increasing the drag as much as possible. And I needed that drag at that point. I called for the gear down. That would increase the drag. I called for assault flaps, which is uh, much further down than normal, and this increases the drag even more. Uh, then, with all that drag out, I could rotate the airplane over uh, really at a steep angle. And uh, I remember uh, thinking, uh, okay, my uh, flap blow-up speed, which is the speed at which the flap will start coming back up because of the wind pressure, was 135 knots. I kept saying, I cannot exceed 135 knots. At the same time, I'm, I'm turning the airplane, and it's going down so steeply that I can't see anything except jungle out of the windscreen. And I looked up, and there's a couple of windows over the pilot's head. Uh, and I remember looking out of those uh, windows uh, to judge my approach. Displaying superb airmanship and extraordinary heroism, he landed his aircraft near the point where the combat control team was reported to be hiding. I was approaching uh, from the southwest uh, towards the end of the runway that is shown there and actually rolled out less than a quarter of a mile from the end of the runway, touched down in that light spot and uh, came to a breaking stop to the position that you see the airplane right now. Uh, just a little bit on this side of the airplane is the remains of a helicopter that had been shot down earlier in the day. The little light spot on the left side is, a, is an O2 that had been shot down earlier in the day. Uh, it was being flown by the forward air controller for that area. Uh, just on this side of the O2 is a C-130 that uh, had uh, been shot up so badly on final approach that all four engines had to be sh shut down because they were running out of control. The hydraulic system had been shot out of the airplane. The landing gear was down, however, the pilot had no control of the airplane since there was no hydraulics in it. It ran off the runway and was uh, uh, ran into a ditch and uh, the airplane was wrecked. Uh, over on the right hand side of the runway, about equal to that uh, O2 airplane is the remains of a helicopter that had been uh, also shot down earlier in the day. And you can see the white spots in the runway and that's a result of, of mortar fire and artillery uh, fire that had impacted the runway. Uh, the buildings on both the, the right and left side of the runway were, in, were burning, a good many of them in flames. On the left side of the runway, there's an ammo dump. This is uh, flashes of ammunition uh, that's being blown up or is blowing up because of the heat in the ammo dump. Uh, 
the the airfield was really in shambles. While on the ground, his aircraft was the target of intense hostile fire. We could hear the automatic weapons fire, uh, heavy machine guns, and rifle fire. And there was lots of that. There was a machine gun position been set up under the wing of this C-130 here. Also, an automatic weapons position had been set up in this uh, bunch of uh, crates and boxes there uh, by the North Vietnamese, and they were firing uh, at our airplane from that position. The, the runway was just completely surrounded with uh, people uh, firing at us. Everything was, was uh, uh, happening, they say, a lot of people say, uh, so fast. Well, really, it isn't so fast. It seemed like everything is in real slow motion. I don't know whether we're speeded up or everything else is slowed down, but it seems like everything is moving in slow motion. If you look more closely uh, in front of my airplane, you can see two of the figures uh, of the men that are running toward the airplane to get on board. Uh, I've, I've often said that uh, the third one was running so fast that the shutter couldn't catch him. And I remember saying to, to Jesse Campbell, Jesse, I, I wish they would uh, not run directly towards the airplane because I can turn it faster than they can run. Well. Uh, then when I got a good look at them running, I decided that was wrong. They could run a lot faster than I could turn. Uh, so they ran around. They had to go around the airplane and come in the back door because you can't come in the uh, troop doors when the engines are running. It's, it's much too dangerous. So they belly flopped on the, on the floor of the airplane. I was looking back to see how they were uh, coming along and getting on board the airplane when Jesse Campbell uh, yelled out, hey, look at that, uh, or something to that effect. And anyway, a rocket had been fired directly towards the airplane and had skidded down the runway and broken in half and came to a stop about 25 feet in front of the airplane. Uh, fortunately, it didn't go off. Once the combat control team was aboard, Colonel Jackson succeeded in getting airborne despite the hostile fire directed across the runway in front of his aircraft. There comes a time, I think, uh, in situations like that when, when you lose, seem to lose uh, your fear. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a very fearful situation. But at some time, it seems that you come in control of your fear, and it doesn't seem to bother you anymore. Uh, afraid? Absolutely. Scared half to death, I suppose. But I don't think that was uh, controlling me at that time. <clears throat> and uh, as I looked over and I saw the rocket, I, I remember thinking, well, thank goodness it didn't explode. And, uh, and then went on about my business. His plane was on the ground for no longer than one minute. And as Jackson's C-123 turned and taxied down the runway, the spot where the plane had been just seconds earlier exploded with a shower of rocket and mortar rounds. By then, Colonel Jackson was airborne with all on board safe. The C-123 survived the one-minute mission with not one enemy round hitting the plane. A tremendous feeling of relief. Just a big a big sigh and sort of completely exhausted and as if you had been working hard all day uh, of course we had been been flying for uh, almost uh, for 10 hours that day already but it was just a, a com complete collapse just exhausted and a feeling of of thankfulness too. Heroes will return in a moment. Turn to heroes. Being a pilot was a goal to which Joe Jackson had aspired since the age of five. I was uh, walking down the road with my father and one of my brothers and an airplane flew over. And I remember saying to him that when I grow up, 
I'm going to work on airplanes. And that really is the first thing in my life that I remember. And aviation has been a part of it ever since. Jackson now lives outside of Seattle, Washington with his wife, Rose. He has two grown children. His memories of flying are still vivid to the pilot. Learning to fly during World War II, flying 107 combat missions in the Korean War, piloting a U-2 reconnaissance plane in the late 50s, and the time in Vietnam. Especially that day when he took his C-123 into Cam Duck, for which he received the Medal of Honor. Jackson remembers one of the three men he rescued coming up to talk with him. One of them came up to the cockpit and said something to the effect that, that uh, it was awfully heroic of us to come down and, and pick him up. Uh, but you know, uh, just the feeling of, uh, of having done so, having gotten them out of there, uh, we didn't need any words to say thank you. We, you know, we could feel it ourselves that that we had done something kind of special, and having done it was really was a reward in itself. Hero, a person admired for courage, nobility, or exploits, especially in war. A person admired for qualities or achievements and regarded as an ideal or model. He rose to the occasion. He met the challenge. He inspired us. He is a hero. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.